Hi, I'm Joan Agajanian Quinn, and welcome to Beverly Hills View. We've lived in Beverly Hills for 50 years and love our city. So here to talk about it with us and about our city is singer, composer, performer, Ty Jeffries, direct from London. He was born and raised in the UK, studied at the prestigious Purcell School of Music in London, and graduated with a BA from Middlesex University. This musical genius, Ty Jeffries, spent two years at Beverly Hills Catholic School on Linden, the same school that my twins attended. So what were you doing in Beverly Hills? <laughs> I was there with my father, Lionel Jeffries, and we all came over from from London while he was shooting a movie called Camelot here. The famous actor, Lionel yes. Jeffries. Yeah, Joshua Logan directed, it was Vanessa Redgrave and Richard Harris. So we all decamped here and we lived on 809 North Camden Drive um, in a beautiful home there that was actually uh, Spencer Tracy and Catherine Hepburn's love nest. And part of our uh, release was that we had to let her continue to swim in the pool in the morning. Is that right? Yeah. And so you could walk to Beverly Hills Catholic from where you were. Yes, yeah, I guess fantastic. so, yes. And who else used to come to your house <laughs> besides that Catherine Hepburn was swimming every morning? She was swimming every morning. Um, Fred Astaire was a great friend of my father's. In fact, my, my godmother is Arva Astaire, his, his daughter. So they lived near you, too. Yeah. Because he used to walk down Cannon every morning yes. and then go to the Beverly Hills Post Office. Yes, I know. Those were the days. <laughs> And uh, he used to come around to the house. I remember him, actually, when we first arrived, we stayed at the Chateau Marmont Hotel. And we had a little house and a pool that was very glamorous. And um, Maurice Chevalier came over and he used to sing to me and sat on his knee and he used to sing to me. I went swimming with um, Vanessa Redgrave's husband, Franco Nero. <gasps> Wow. And he was in the movie too, so it was a very um, a glamorous time. Did it take that long to film it, or was he making other films? Uh, I think it took t uh, 18 months. Did it? Uh, f I, wow. I don't know how many, uh, how much time that was actually shooting, but he was. We were here for two years. So. Wow! And you lived almost to sunset. And right across from Sunset, across Sunset was Hosea Turby's house. Yes. And Donnell Dadigan, who's the founder director of the Hollywood Museum, yes. is the director of the Hosea Turby Foundation. Yes. And he was a great pianist. Yes. Um, and talking about the Hollywood Museum, we taped another interview for yes. the Joan Quinn Profiles yes. at the Hollywood Museum. Yes. Wow. That was that was a <laughs> wonderful surprise. I, I've been here. I came 15 years ago and wanted to go to the Hollywood Museum. I, I know that Debbie Reynolds sa saved a lot of stuff. Of costumes, costumes yes. And, but and she didn't it. have a museum to put it in. No, that was the, the no. pity. So thank goodness Donnell did it. Yes, and what an amazing experience. I recommend it to everybody. I mean, just seeing Joan Crawford's eyelashes in a little box was is a huge thrill for me, and Greta Garbo's <laughs> makeup case and everything. Yeah. Let's, we'll, we'll save the eyelashes for later because I think that's going to play into uh, someone we know, a character yes, that we know. Yes, possibly, yes. Um, um, the museum is in the old Max Factor building, mm. and so all those stars came to those dressing rooms yes. downstairs and yeah. had their makeup. They had a brownette room instead of a brunette room, oh, and a blonde room. Yes. So. So, but he created makeup as we know it. Yes. I mean, from from the very very basics, from old pan stick and and wax. The pan pan yeah. yeah what was pan, it? Pan stick. Pan and stick and and he pancake uh, pancake. <laughs> and then they but they originally were and they used the actors. Um, um, sticks crayons almost of of, oh, of very thick, five right? and nine and they used to make up their faces but it didn't film well so he had to invent new makeup, new colors, and oh, finishes, that, yeah. Maybe that's where Pancake Man came yeah, from, because it was thinner. Yeah, he created that. Yeah. Well, you knew all these stars growing up, but you actually spent your childhood in London, I mean, after you left Beverly yes. Hills. Um, did you have the same kind of atmosphere at your house there? Yes, very much so, <laughs> yeah. really. I mean, it was Hollywood here, and it was Pinewood in, in um, London, so outside London is the film studios, and we live we live very near there, and my father would be able to drive to work. He, he made a lot of films at Pinewood. So we had, you know, dropping names like Diana Dawes, who was the British oh. bombshell. She was my parents' 
best friend. Beautiful. So she would come to the house. Um, uh, Lee Remick came to the house mm -hmm. a number of times, and Fred Astaire came to stay the weekend. And they had fabulous parties with people like wonderful Patricia Neal, who was a great friend, uh -huh. and Raul Dahl. Where, oh, and her uh, husband. Yeah. Yes, so he, Raul Dahl used to come up and sit on my bed because I, I would have to go to bed, of course. I was only, <laughs> only little, and he'd come and sit on my bed and tell me stories that he would make up. And every time he came, he would tell me another bit oh, of the story. Because he was writing children's books. Yes, yeah. And so you got to hear them first, probably, yes, right? Yes, absolutely, yeah. Oh, that's so that's, great. That's great. And then, uh, where was that? Where, that was a place called Beaconsfield, uh, Beaconsfield, Buckinghamshire. Oh, it's only about 40 oh, it's, minutes from London. It's a little bit outside. Yeah. And it was mm. very much where a lot of the movie community lived. Margaret Rutherford lived there. Oh. I don't know if she's known here, but she was a famous oh, very, British yeah. character actress. She lived there with her husband, Stringer Davis. So we used to go over and have tea with her. So, so that was like your little community. Yes. I mean, the community of um, actors. Yes. Thespians. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. I mean, we lived in a little group of houses Little Prestwick, Prestwick Place, and Old Prestwick. And oh. the Prestwick Place had been Laurence Olivier and Vivian Lee's home. Oh. And he practiced the Henry V speeches on a horse in the field. And uh, the Bolting brothers, who were very famous film writers and directors, lived in our house. We didn't realize it until we moved in and found lots of photographs in the in the attic. Is that right? Yeah. They always talk about finding photographs in the attic and yes. what its surprises come up, yes. right? Yes, I've got a painting in the attic. Of uh, someone's? Of, well, of, you know, like Dorian Gray. Oh, you yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, while you were growing up and you had all these people around you, did you think of following in your father's footsteps? Were you going to be an actor? Um, I was a musician from the, the get-go, really. Uh, we had a piano that was left to us in the shed. I, I mentioned, uh, 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 and I used to go in there and play, and I just found I could play the piano. And I started writing songs when I was five years old. Before you even took lessons, you were yes, in there? Yes, so you have a yes. musical I'm self-taught, really. More, more, I, I'm quite dyslexic, so I can't actually read music. But I write. I just write instinctively. So how do you write, then? Um, do you, it, I record. I record everything. Oh, no. I write the lyrics down. And I have I'm, I'm quite a, a, a resourceful memory. I, I, I can remember <laughs> huge, vast <laughs> tracks. I mean, whole one-man shows. I've got them all up here that Is I can that right? do. Yes. So do you play another instrument or just that? I, I used to play the violin. My, my mom and dad used to send me very, very far down to the end of the garden to play the violin to the cows. Oh, because I, I see. Wasn't very were good there at cows there actually? No, the there cows, actually the were? The cows would all come up and look over the fence so looking at me like that. But that was the only audience I had for the violin. Were you taking any kind of acting classes? I did later. When I went to Middlesex, I did... In uh, university? Yes. And then also when I came back here about 15 years ago, I did some acting classes here. Oh, you did? Yeah. Where? In Hollywood? In or? Hollywood, yeah. And then I, and I've done some straight acting, you know, recently I did a play, had the lead in a play about the man who wrote the song Pack Up Your Troubles in Your Old Kit Bag. Oh, really? And where was, was that? In London? That was outside London in, in a place called Peacehaven where he lived and it was all about the area and his Was it story. a one-person show? No, it wasn't. It was, uh, it was, I was sort of musical directing and acting and singing and... Well, instead of following that career, I think you had another career. You created a character. Yes. And she, can we call her your alter ego? Yes, by all means. Oh, we can. Okay. Yeah. Miss Hope Springs. <laughs> Miss Hope Springs. Yeah. She has um, a wonderful career in cabaret. Yes. And we have a picture of her on yeah. this CD that she, yeah. that she made. Yeah. And she has a lot of hair. She has a lot of hair. And a lot of eyelashes. A lot of eyelashes. <laughs> and and floor-to-ceiling sequins, black sequin pantsuit. But she's a real person. It, you know, it broadly is drag, but it's really, I call it gender illusion because she <laughs> is a believable woman and she has a backstory and she's vulnerable and she sings, I've written the entire uh, repertoire for her and she sings all the songs from her life. She's very cheeky. She has some little cheeky moments. <laughs> Is she, does she do more body, body, mm -hmm. cheeky stuff for different audiences? Um, <laughs> if she you were in Las Vegas, <laughs> would she do a different show? I think she'd probably do a bigger show. I mean, I think that the small cabaret rooms are no longer existing, really, in, in Las Vegas. So I think she'd have to do one of the huge theaters, of course, and she'd have 
dancers and everything, but at the right moment now, it's just her at the piano. Well, we're, ta tell us a little bit about Miss Hope Springs. Miss Hope Springs is, is a never was rather than a has been. <laughs> and she started out in show business in the early six, 70s, as she says. And um, she's never quite made it. Uh, and she has a mother. She has a mother called Rusty, Rusty Springs, and a grandmother called Elkie Seltzer. <laughs> and, uh, a, and a husband who's and not very nice. Irving, well, Irving is very nice. Irving is very gay. So oh, he's, you know, he's off doing his thing, and she's, she's trying to k keep the marriage alive, but it's not really working. Does she have any children? No, no. Oh, no. so she's a really alone person yes. doing her own yeah. repertoire yes. in little rooms. Yes, that's right. She's a bit like Lassie. After, <laughs> after every show, she packs her bag and her sequin pantsuit, pantsuit and off she goes again to the next venue. Well, where does she live, actually? She lives in a, in a, in a Winnebago. A trailer? A trailer, <laughs> yeah. And what city is that in? Well, wherever she happens to be. Oh, she takes She it parks it up in the car park of Home Depot I and see. spends the night there. And... One of the things that I learned, because I saw Miss Hope Springs perform at the Gardenia Room in West Hollywood, which is our neighbor just to the east on Santa Monica Boulevard. It's one of the few cabaret um, venues that's really left in the city. We had a fabulous one on Cannon called The Little Club. Yes. And Frances Fay used to sing, and my husband and I, 50 years ago, used to go in there. Yeah. And she had the best show. It was very small, little supper club feeling. Yes. Yes. And that's how the Gardenia, I think the Gardenia is 35 years old. It's 35 years old. And, and as you say, it's probably one of the last remaining cabaret rooms. But there is a lot of cabaret, especially in London. There's a huge boom in cabaret. I perform at the Crazy Cox it, right there in Piccadilly Circus. I've been there for four years resident. But th there is a huge resurgence. And I think, I think, you know, I'm trying to bring it back single-handedly, that vintage uh, t almost like TV special at Peggy Lee and uh, those wonderful intimate evenings of song and stories. Um, the thing is, we don't know about cabaret. It's too slow for what's going on now. It's a very slow type of atmosphere. Yeah. Tell us about it a little bit. Well, I think it's it's especially my show, I can only speak for my show, but I'm taking people into a, a, a another era. And you do have to, I mean, you don't, people don't know what my show is about until they come and see it. They immediately think, well, there's a guy who dresses up as a woman and it's going to be a certain kind of act, especially in England, because drag has a, has a bad rap, you know, it's, it's sort of the end of the pier, as we call it. But here people consider drag to be more of an art form. And Definitely, you had yeah. stars like Charles Pierce and Jim Bailey, who were great artists. And I always thought, I always called Holly Woodlawn a drag queen, too. Yes. I mean, we loved Holly. She yes. was very close to us. Yes. And she was, but she was always dressed like that. Yes. You're not dressed like that. You're no. not dressed like that. Your character's dressed yes. like that. I think Holly was transgender, which is very different from me. I'm an actor and, I, and a songwriter, and I had, to, I had to find a way of getting my work out there. Uh, oh, I, I was writing for Liza. I was writing for... Um, Bette Midler and for Peggy. Barbara Streisand. No, but really, oh, I, I, I believe was too, too, yeah, well, too old, was, right? Was, yeah, sadly. <laughs> I mean, I would have, and also she wrote her own songs, a lot of her own songs. Uh -huh. In fact, I spent the day with her, uh, Holly Foster Wells, her granddaughter, yesterday in her, her archive, and she S kindly she showed. Sa she said, Holly said she had a Peggy Lee room. She does. Fabulous room with all the, uh, all the f press photographs and candid family photographs and, and all her press cuttings, all done by Peggy and all her little notebooks. And also I got to hear demos of songs that Peggy recorded and wrote and recorded that were never ever released. So it was a great honor, a real treasure trove. We're gonna take a break, but we'll be right back and we'll finish talking about Peggy Lee. Great. We'll be right back. So good to see you guys. So what's up? Oh, we finally bought a place. Holy cow. You seriously have enough saved to do that? We've been putting a little aside each month. Mm -hmm. Jeez, at the end of the month, we have nothing left to save. Yeah, I have no idea where it goes. Well, you're mm -hmm. spending a lot on... Mm -hmm. 
Is it good? Oh, God. Oh, how is my account overdrawn? When it comes to financial stability, don't get left behind. Get tools and tips for saving at feedthepig.org. Hey. Look at Mommy. Maybe the light hurts his eyes. Maybe she's just not hungry. Look. Maybe it's a phase. Avoiding eye contact is one early sign of autism. Learn the others today. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and welcome back to the Beverly Hills View. We're talking to performer Ty Jeffries, and we just left off when he was talking about Peggy Lee and this wonderful archive that her granddaughter, Holly... Holly Foster Wells. Holly Foster Wells has. Yeah. And one thing about Holly Foster Wells is her mother went to Westlake. And I went to Westlake with her, Nikki oh, Barber, wow. because uh, right. Peggy Lee was married to Dave Barber, That's the right. musician, the musical director. Yes. And she was so cute. Yes. Nikki Barber was yeah. adorable. Well, Holly's a beautiful girl, too. She's beautiful. And, and also, all those singers used to come to Good Shepherd. Yes. Because there, were a, there was a group of, of women and men who would come to church on Sunday mornings. Uh, and you knew somebody that used yes. to come, Yes, well, didn't because you? we used to go to the Church of the Good Shepherd <laughs> on Sundays to Mass. And uh, my father, Lionel, had worked with Rosalind Russell <laughs> uh, on a movie. And they were pals. And she used to come to church. And I remember how lovely she was, how tall she was and elegant. Elegant. And she would just always talk to me in such a lovely, warm way as sort of person to person rather than adult to child. She used to sit in the front row with her mother, Gladys Belzer, who was a great decorator. Everyone wanted her to decorate their house. And her sister, who was married to Ricardo Montalban wow. at the time. And coming down uh, for the offering was Ray Bolger. So we yeah. had a great church at that yeah. era. <laughs> and you were a part of it yes, all, really. Yes, yeah. um, Very lucky to have been part of it. I don't, I don't think Peggy Lee came there, but let's go back to, to what else yes. you learned there. Um, uh, well, I mean, just a lot of people say that my Miss Hope Springs, my character looks like Dusty Springfield, and I've always said, oh, she's much more Peggy Lee. Ah, so uh, you had that connection. Yes, and Holly said, well, it's funny because Pe uh, Dusty Springfield was a huge Peggy Lee fan and had sort of modeled her look on her. So it, oh, there's so a it's kind like of, a really a circle. It's a oh, circle. is that? Well, when we were at the Gardenia Room the other night, you had a total show business crowd. Yeah. She, Holly was there, yeah. Ava Astaire, yeah. Yeah. Juliet Mills, yes. uh, who was great friends. Her parents were great friends of your... He, my parents, Johnny, John, Sir John Mills and Mary Mills, the, the playwright. And also um, Andrew Abelson was there, who's Frankie Vaughan's son. Oh, Frankie oh, Vaughan was in, uh, I think it was Some Like It Hot, not Some Like It Hot. Um, uh, what was the movie? I don't know which one he with was with Marilyn Monroe, and anyway, somebody he was might the, come he up was, with it. He, his father was yeah. Frankie Vaughan starred with Marilyn Monroe in, and I can't remember the name of the movie. But um, also Neil McQueen yes. was there, and my friend Daniel Orlandi, who's a great costumer of uh, of movies. He's yes. worked with Tom Hanks and um, who know you know yes. like this long list of of people he's going to New Orleans to work yeah. with Hugh Jackman. Yes. So it was you a had great a really night. interesting night. Yeah, it, was a, it was like old Hollywood, the next generation sort right, of thing. Yeah, right. it was fabulous. Well, let's get back to Miss um, Springs, Miss yes. Hope Springs. She likes to travel. Yes, but I don't think she has a fixed abode, so she has no real choice but to travel. But she's quite international. She had yes. that wonderful song about Pigalle. Yes, oh yes, she spent some time in Paris, <laughs> and she spent time in, in, you know, all over the world. Whether she's actually done it, or possibly it's a figment of her medication, we're not quite <laughs> sure, but she spins yarns, and um, yeah. Yeah, you, dr you write all of the music. Is the that lyric, what all the music is? and the lyrics? Is it always original? No, oh, no by all me uh, no. I mean, I'm one of the few acts that writes all their own material, music and lyrics, and I, I, I arrange all the songs as well. Mo a lot of them are cabaret, especially in London, uh, and he over here is the Great American Songbook and reinterpretations uh -huh. of that. So it's Gershwin and Cole Porter and Harold Arlen. Usually? And usually. And, and do they talk in between? Because you tell stories in between. Yes. Or she tells stories in between. Usually people do, to some extent or other. But my show, my show is really a musical theater 
about a cabaret singer. And it is also cabaret, but it's really musical theater because you're taken into a world, you believe in the character, she, she, she tells you that the, the whole, you know, spins a dramatic arc and tells you her story. And the songs work in that as, as the sort of musical illustration. And I write all the songs, so some are like Gershwin, some are a little bit back oh, wacky. Yes, I noticed some were faster, slower. Yeah. Some are witty, trendy, some are, yeah. some are, well, I think as trendy as she gets is about 1970, so. That's trendy, you know. <laughs> that's trendy. Trendy for her. Trendy for her, right, right down with the kids. There. But so have you been yourself? To Paris a lot? Yes, I, well I was a model in, in the late 80s, I hate to say, when I was a child model. <laughs> um, oh, weren't we all? <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and I did all the shows, I worked for Gautier and Comte de Garçon, oh. and I was the first guy with a shaved head to be a top male model uh, for about four or five years. So you could you drew on those experiences, yes. being in Paris and of course yes. living in London. Li and living out of a suitcase myself during those those oh, those years. Just modeling. like Miss Hope Springs. Yes. She so lives in so a it's quite autobiographical in some ways. That's what I was wondering. Apart that's, from that's, her hair. Apart from the hair. Yeah. Well the hair is big. Yeah. It's big really because it's gotta be proportionate and then if I'm sitting at a nice grand piano and the hair is big and the lashes are big and the lips are a little bigger and the jewelry is big, it makes me look smaller, it makes me look more But petite. how tall are you? Oh, you're model tall. I'm 6'2". Yeah, you're model tall, that's yeah. why, right? So she needs, when you come out, in heels? Little heels. Little but heels. You look huge when you come, when you walk down, everyone's sitting at their dinner tables. Um, I am huge, that's why. <laughs> what other, <laughs> in the U.S., let's talk about what other, yes. you were in New York? I was in New York, um, at the Metropolitan Room, had a fabulous show there. So fabulous. we do have some cabaret rooms left. Oh, absolutely, there is a big cabaret scene internationally. There's a magazine called Cabaret Scenes, ah. which goes to all the uh, cabaret rooms, and there were a lot of them, and on the West Coast and the East Coast, and every town really still has cabaret rooms. So you were in New York, San Diego. San Diego, LA, going up to, to San, Francisco. San Francisco, and then New York again with four shows there. Oh, you, d oh, you do, yeah. I, I see. I and then see. I'm back to London the 24th of April to, to my, um, my, my residency, pick up my residency there at the Crazy Cox. The um, process of dressing. Yeah. I know how long it takes me to get dressed to come to the show, <laughs> but how long does it take you to put on three sets of eyelashes? Well, start at the beginning and tell me what you do. And where do you do it? In a dressing room at the, sh at the place? Yes. Or, or um, at home? Before no, you? I start out at home because I shave, because it's a character part. I have to feel, I uh, shave my arms and my chest and my legs. And then I go and I, I usually warm up or I do a rehearsal and then I, oh, I, do. I do, you know, so I you block it So you get to the out. venue early. Yeah, I mean, I'm there. I mean, I was there at four o'clock oh, uh, on, on Saturday and we did the For show at nine o'clock. Yeah. And it takes me two and a half hours to do the makeup because it's all different foundations and contouring. But it's not a drag makeup. I do a makeup that makes it's, me look like a real woman. Yeah, and, very and, real. Yeah. The only thing that isn't real are the eyelashes. And the, you uh, have jokes about the eyelashes. Well, I don't know any woman in show business whose eyelashes are real to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> if they're real, but you can't see them. you're a natural beauty, darling. No, but if, you, if they're real, you can't see them, no, right? exactly. So when you go to put on your glasses, what do you do? Uh, well, you know that when I, <laughs> in, the, in the show, Miss Hope Springs reads the song that uh, supposedly was written for her by Noel Coward. Oh, yes. And of course, she, she, <laughs> can't, she can't get the glasses on because she doesn't know if they should be outside or inside. So exactly. they get squashed up against the glass. And you're like always like, oh, my lashes. Yes. Um, is there a lot of uh, interaction with the audience? It happens naturally. I mean, there's always something. There's always someone who, who starts a little repartee, and a little bit is fine, but then if they go on too much, I'll shut them down. How do you do that? Because you were like really natural with them. Do you know, do you have those uh, responses ready? <laughs> they're they they're there, come? they just come, and sometimes <laughs> I say things, you know, I mean, she's not an unkind person, but she, she, <laughs> she, she will, you know, put people in their place, and, and people like that, I think. They quite like her being uh, a little, maybe turning a little Margaret Thatcher on them. And you don't have to do a lot of costuming. I don't. I mean, I keep it very simple. She has this one outfit that she escaped the um, 
Pink Pelican Casino with in, 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 19, Las, Vegas. in Las Vegas. <laughs> it doesn't exist, but it sounds like exactly. it exists. And just before it was demolished and blown up with dynamite, she managed to just get in, grab one costume and her sheet music and get out. So that's all you need to travel with that's is one yeah. and, and a makeup bag, a mm, lot yeah, of makeup lot probably, of, right? Lot, quite a lot of makeup, yes. And just a touch of glitter mascara and some What powder. about jewelry? Again, Same just jewelry? earrings and rings. But the earrings are like down to yeah, here. Yeah. But it's not, hopefully it's not a drag look. It's, as I say, it's a, it's a, I mean, I think of her being like, more like Buster Keaton or Charlie Chaplin, mm. a sad clown. Do you change your voice when you sing? No. Because it sounds so natural. I think I'm a sort of the B. Arthur school of singing, oh, where it's maybe. sort of down in my boots, but I, I feminize my voice, I soften my voice to express that more vulnerable I side. Can, because it's a little different than what you're saying now because you get pretty soon you just think that she's that's her voice and yeah. it's a, like a perfect woman's voice like a deep voice yeah when we talked about interaction you sang this song called the zodiac song the zodiac lover yes zodiac lover yeah tell us a little bit about that well that's that, that is that supposedly so from her mother one of her relatives uh, back catalogue the flaming flappers of 45 <laughs> And uh, yeah, it's just a, a sort of uh, a, a witty kind of fun song about the Zodiac and, and she's trying to find her man and she's tried all the signs so far and hasn't succeeded, poor thing. And when you said, you say something and for the like to the audience. Yeah, I forget I say, what the what's line what's your is. sign? Oh, and then somebody yeah, answered you. They, yeah, and, you went. <laughs> and then I said, I didn't really want to know. <laughs> And then someone else answered. Yeah, I couldn't you. believe it. After that, you know, somebody also um, told, me, that, told me their that? sign. I think there's something about Miss Hope Springs that's slightly threatening, and they're Just slightly like frightened. <laughs> they don't quite know what to do, so they don't, they fess up. They tell me their sign. Does that happen all the time yes, when you it sing does. it? It, it does. does. It does. Yeah. The other one that was so great, and all the lights went red, was "The Devil Made Me Do It." Yes, that's Hope's theme song. Really, that's I always use that as my rep uh, my encore at the end of the show. Oh, I see. And it sort of touches on some of the things in her life that she may or may not have done, including finishing off a husband or two. Oh, she took care of that. <laughs> she, did, she, she took did. care of that, right? Mm. Um, does does um, Hope go out dressed like that ever to charity events? Yes, or she does. To, to charity events, I'll do if I'm invited and they want Miss Hope Springs to to come. I'll I do that, and I do a lot of parties. I do a lot of private parties and events where, you know, Hope comes and does the show and also she'll mingle and oh, talk to people. Oh, she does both, off. I see. Yeah, but when I'm usually, when I'm doing a theater show, after the show is over, I go backstage and I take it all off and I come out as myself because if I have to come out as Hope after a two hour show and then spend another hour talking to people in character, it's, it's too much. Yeah. But you did at the Gardenia. Yeah. You came out in costume. Yeah. I'm calling it costume. Yeah. And everyone was taking pictures and yes. everyone was so excited to see you because yeah. it was a very enthusiastic crowd. I know Julie Esposito was sitting next to us and she went, I perform here all the time. I knew he'd be fabulous. Yeah. You yes. know, it was like people who really didn't know you but actually are cabaret singers as well. Yes, I mean, it's funny because um, even Holly Foster Wells said, you know, I've seen photographs of you at the piano, but oh, I didn't right. really realize you could play. Um, I know, <laughs> because it's shocking, you play so much, yeah. and you don't expect that. Yeah, it's it's a very, <laughs> it, somebody said I'm like, they, I remind them of Joe Ann Castle, who is a, a, quite a famous uh, American uh, cabaret, well, a television entertainer from the 60s, and she played the piano, she was blonde, and she played the piano and had a sort of big grin on her face. But she was not a, a, in drag. No, she was a, she was a real woman. She was a yeah. real woman, like Frances Faye, she did the yes, same kind of yes. thing. So yeah. Miss Hope Springs and is really. And she knew how to play. Yeah, Miss Hope Springs is, is, a, is a portrait of a lady from that era. Do you, have you ever done a big uh, stage show of hers with dancers? I'm, no, and I haven't. The, the biggest thing I did was the, the Talk of the Town in London, the, the wonderful oh, right. uh, Hippodrome Casino right. as it is now, which is a big stage, huge piano, fabulous, fabulous setup, really. Um, and it was lovely to just tread the boards that Judy Garland and Frank Sinatra trod. She needs to be on stage. She needs more than what you have. You have a little group behind you. How do you find that group? 
I mean, I booked Julie Esposito, who's a wonderful cabaret singer. She she found me a couple of great musicians. Oh, is that how that yeah, happened? Because I, how do you know who to call? And do you book yeah. at each city that yes. you go to? Well, some some shows I'm doing solo. Other shows I'm doing with a with a band. Oh. Um, but and yeah. How do they pick up so fast? Well, I have the music. I have the sheet music. I have they the have parts <laughs> written, and they have to read, <laughs> right. and they have to be very good musicians, which they were wonderful oh, musicians. Oh, I yeah, see. Though you have the great great musicians in L.A. And then you let them go, and you do your act by yourself, yes. which is great. Yeah, it just changes it up a little bit and gives it another texture. Well, the reason I say you have to be on stage is because uh, Dame Edna has a big stage show. Yes. Does Holly, uh, does Holly, does Hope know Dame Edna? Um, I know Barry Humphreys. I mean, I've sat, had lunch with him and met him a number of times. He's, he's fantastic. He's brilliant. But he's a great actor, too, yeah. in the same vein that you're talking about. Yeah. His character is much more extravagant and much more drag Much than more mine. drag. Yeah, I mean, mine is really, it's, it's, it is intimate. It is low-key. It's very, it's very, um, it's very personal, and I think the audience feels that they're in a private conversation with me. But Dame Edna goes on stage, and she has dancers. Yes. Have you have you written anything like that for yourself? Uh, not really. <laughs> no, it doesn't appeal to me, to be honest, oh. Joan. I really like this this portrait of of this lady who is down on her luck. It's just a piano, a bit of faded glamour, and the stories of her life. It, it's it's not a big. Maybe she could have fantasy sequences. She might uh, not be the person that the Queen would make. Dame, either would she? Sadly, <laughs> I, I think it's never going to happen. I don't think so either. So when Dame Edna's finished, Miss Holly Springs will continue. Miss Hope Springs. Yes. Miss Hope Springs. I yeah. keep calling well, her Well, because Holly. we've been talking about Hollywood Lawn and Holly Foster Wells. Oh, and, all these Hollies. And all the H's. So, so excuse me. That's you tell Miss Hope Springs that I'm very sorry. No, and I want to thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you, Joe. You have to move back to Beverly Hills. Don't tempt me. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank so, you so much. much. Thank you. And thank you for watching the Beverly Hills View today, and we'll see you next time. <laughs>